Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I am joined by somebody you all know, the great Jonathan Paggio. How are you doing today, sir? Doing great. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for taking time to uh, to come on and, and have a conversation. I know how busy you are, and um, I've been watching your stuff really since, like I think, 2017, 2018, wow. and on my channel... You've been one of the most frequently requ requested people because of how many people you've affected and brought into the Orthodox Church. Well, yeah, well, it's great. That's crazy that you've been there since the 2017. That's really the beginning of when I started doing these public things. So uh, wow. I know is it the first video of yours that I watched, which uh, was really profound for me, was your video on Santa Claus. OK. And the reality of Santa Claus. Um, and that's going to tie in really today when we start getting into the Logi archetypes. Uh, symbols and all that type of stuff. Um, but even before we get into today's topic, I was curious, you know, what what has the last few years been like for you? Uh, it, it, I mean, it seems like it's kind of been a whirlwind. Yeah, it feels that way. It's very surprising. You know, in some ways, it feels like a Kairos situation where all these elements kind of came together and made it possible for not just myself, but a, but a few people to talk about the spiritual life talk about even liturgy you know icons all these things in a way that now secular people could understand and so you know before i started doing these public things i was already you know we had started the orthodox art journal i was talking about symbolism within the orthodox church you know i didn't never thought that this would just kind of leak out into the world and so yeah it, it has been it's been wild it's been kind of kind of crazy but glory to god you know glory to, god. to see the the people to see these young guys go to church and you know there's this there's this amazing movement so it's wonderful yeah i know i actually did a stream called the jordan peterson phenomenon yeah because that whole uh you know explosion from 16 17 18 uh it, it was a catalyst for so many young men to eventually find orthodoxy and 
you know, here in North America, here in the U.S. at least, uh, orthodoxy has really been growing. I've, I've, I have multiple priests that have come on the channel. Not a single one has not said there has been a dramatic uptick in young men joining the church, taking their faiths in women, too. But uh, mostly, mostly young men um, uh, taking it seriously. And it's so it's so it's so funny how Jordan Peterson and people engaging with his content, uh, learning of, again, him talking about Jung and archetypes and Dostoevsky. And um, this led to so many people. And then, of course, 2020 uh, taking their faith seriously. I mean, it's it's it, it really is a sort of providential occurrence. Definitely. And, and it's weird because in some ways, COVID helped because it seemed that covid kind of put everybody against the wall and basically said okay which story do you want like what 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 is it that's real here you know uh and so a lot of people out, came out during covid and then towards the end of covid just started flocking to the church same thing my parish tripled really in the past like year and a half which isn't much because it's like this little french canadian parish we used to have 15 <laughs> people you know on a sunday but now, you know, if we have if we have 40, it's not a great it's not it's not a usual Sunday. And so we had we had like a, it's like 110 people at Pasca, which for us is just nuts. Right. Wow. Go yeah. Like 15 people. So. So. So, yeah, it's been it's been really wonderful to see it happen. Yeah. My parish is uh, very small. It's uh, it's quaint. It's like a tur it's a converted uh, uh, lumber yard. So they there. The main office is now the sanctuary. Um, which isn't uncommon in, in uh, the U.S. to find these small Orthodox churches. But it's really it takes this whole Internet culture where people are commenting in the live chats and talking about these things. But then you actually join a parish and participate in parish life. And that's where, uh, as we've talked about before, that's where you're really called to be a Christian. And you engage with the babushkas and the old women and people that have different political opinions or maybe view different things seriously. But you're still called to love them and engage them. And that's really taking all this intellectual stuff, which I'm sure we're going to get into today and putting it more into practice and engaging in the reality of the Eucharist and, and the reality of the church. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's right. One of the things, obviously we've all know that internet orthodoxy in some ways, it tends towards a kind of poison, not all of it, but some of it tends towards like really kind of harsh, really intellectual and very uh, critical of everything. And, you know, very, but, uh, and you know, there's room. There's room for criticism. That's 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 of course real. But when you land into an actual church, like you said, and you end up having to deal with people that you wouldn't be friends with in the normal world, that you wouldn't associate with, and and uh, it 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 kind of softens the edge. And uh, and I'm really hoping, you know, this is I did my call to priests is to say because some of the priests are kind of complaining about these guys that come in with all their ideas and their ideals about what orthodoxy are, like you know, looking for a spiritual father and and you know, kind of. Uh, and I'm like, no, these guys are odd. Like these guys are the energy of the future church. Like they, they are right. like this motor that's coming in. So it's up to the priests and the bishops to be able to, to help them land in the church properly, reorient their thinking a little bit, reorient their desires towards the, towards praxis and towards a, a, a real, real Orthodox practice. But it's a, we have to really see that it's actually a really exciting time. I, I Yeah, I think so too. And all again, almost all the priests, um, that have come on have also felt that same thing that uh, there surely there can be some course correction for people coming in and and there, certainly the the ideal and I was guilty of that going into the church and then seeing when uh, 2020 happened and the and the pandemic and seeing how certain people responded and it seemed like they didn't have the same degree of what I would perceive as faith that when I was getting into the church and then that cause frustration but really that's the beauty of it you know it's somebody that i know you've been in, greatly impacted by saint maximus the confessor uh, the, the church has an ironic history of persecuting its best its yeah. best and brightest and yeah so definitely definitely and i think it's you know we also have to it, especially in terms of the covid stuff you know it, it was difficult because certain people had certain lines of information and other people had other lines of information and so it was difficult to judge others because it it was just like different worlds that were colliding, you know, different narratives, different worlds and different visions. And so hopefully out of this, you know, hopefully out of this will come strength. In my parish, you know, we came close to it being a very dividing factor. Uh, but luckily, through the grace of God, it ended up uniting us because people kind of cal calmed down, toned down their their approach and it brought us together. 
Um, so hopefully that'll be the case for, for most churches. And, and it is sad when the, the churches that took hard lines, you know, uh, in different directions, uh, th those churches and that held their, like kind of held their own uh, very late, especially in COVID, like a lot of those uh, will suffer the consequences of that, I have to say, and I'm seeing it, like the parishes that trended to be more, let's say, focused co on communion and focus on the sacraments, they, they, are, they are the ones that grew the most, right? They're the ones that are going to have the more formal yeah. fruits. And that's where, and it, so that would gets into our topic today. That's why so many young men are trying to find refuge in the church. And really yeah. it is the hospital of the soul. And it is a refuge. When we look at some of the inversion, which I'm sure we're going to touch on today as we, we speak about logos, theology, symbolism, archetypes, um, there is a real satanic inversion. I've watched your videos, whether it be about Little Nas X or some of the stuff that's going on in the world, some of the, the gender hysteria. Um, my academic research is really couched within new religious movements in the Western esoteric religions, yeah. it's focusing on transhumanism. And so mm -hmm. I'm trying to articulate transhumanism as a post-secular new religious movement. Um, and so I would say transhumanism is this <clears throat> incomplete. It's so subtle, but it's the it's orthodoxy. It's the absolute inversion of the orthodox worldview. So we can see theosis. We can see the social social justice ethic of the Christian uh, Christian love, all these things are couched in it. But I think the young men that are seeing this world inverted and they may not be able to put their finger on it or articulate it in the exact same way, but they can feel orthodoxy being this, this form of Christianity that's unchanging and that's grounded in something that's true. Yeah, no, you're totally right. And I think that seeing a lot of what's going on right now through a religious lens is the right way to go about it. Uh, you know, and so, in, and in the one hand, it helps us to be more critical of it in the right way, but it can also help us have a certain amount of compassion for the desire, which is behind it. You know, a lot of people that get swept up in these things, their desire is actually a kind of desire for God and a desire for liturgy, a desire for participation, but because they, they've, they've gotten kind of twisted, then they move to these weird celebrations and these kind of, you know, rainbow liturgies. Right. Uh, but but behind it, it's like, you know, I think that we also as kind of more conservative Orthodox types, we also have to understand that the desire behind it is a desire for God and that we have to always approach people. Be careful when we approach people that aren't in the church and not treat them as if they're in the church, too. It's like people outside the church, they they're in the wild, right? They're in they're in the uh, they're in the forest and they're yeah. just trying to wandering around trying to figure it out, you know. Right. So. To open up then, you know, a lot of what I do on this channel, it's called Church of the Eternal Logos. Obviously, I'm not a church. I try to push everybody. My goal is to get people to go through the front door of an Orthodox church. But I have various topics, and we always approach it from a Logos theological perspective. So we're always approaching whatever topic it be, transhumanism or mimetics or, uh, you know, whatever it be. And so I want to open up, like, if, some, if a, somebody came up to you and said, Jonathan, what exactly is Logos theology? I mean, I've, I've heard this, thing, this concept Logos. I've heard about the Stoics talk about it and Plato. But isn't it like a what? And you guys are claiming this is Jesus Christ? Like, I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, and so I think, I mean, at least the way that I tend to understand it is you can understand it from two sides. One is Christians are monotheists. Like, we believe in God the Father. But the thing that distinguishes us is that we believe that the that the expression of the divine, the expression of God, is completely divine. There's no difference. Like there's no difference of nature between God and His His expression into the world. And so you could see it. I mean, we've used different images to talk about it. We say the Father, the Son. You know, this idea of the logos or the or the this, the kind of manifestation of God. And and this is the mystery of Christianity, and it, you know, it it really is a a powerful vehicle for a, a type of unity with God, which doesn't require us to disappear into God, right? This idea when you see in kind of Vedantic uh, ideas, where you know you're mm -hmm. just a drop in Brahma, and then you just dissolve back into the source, right? right? And so in Christianity, we don't have this idea. We have this idea as if like the crunchy particulars of creation can really be united with God, can participate in God through grace. Uh, and so from the side, from that side, it's it's this powerful vision that um, as God connects with the world, right? The thing that made the world exist is God fully, right? Isn't some lower 
form of of divinity you know some some uh some intermediary being or whatever so that's like for us on our side it's 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 very hopeful but then from the side of creation it also means that at the center of all things right hidden behind all the multiplicity is this logos and so you know we we formulate it differently say maximus formulates it in different ways he'll say things like behind every phenomenon everything you can recognize as having being there is mm -hmm. a lo there's a logo so the logi be hidden behind right and so that everything has its purpose that's hidden behind it everything has something which is leading it up towards towards god and that ultimately that the logi are the logos and that's what is even crazier for people it's like like actually christ you know the divine logos is hidden behind all things that have being and so in the proper state you know in a state of uh if we are able to purify our passions if we're able to you know enter into communion with god then we can actually perceive this in the world right. we see the world like shining and bright with with the presence of god and that god is actually hiding behind uh, all of creation so it's a very beautiful and powerful vision of reality which avoids the pantheistic error of thinking that all things are gods and all things are god or whatever but right. really this notion that all things are kind of are, are behind all things god is hiding like the source of of everything and that if we see it if we approach it properly then we can encounter him in in anyone and in everything. I, I think you hit on it with that p the particulars and the unity. So when you you know looking through the history of world religions and philosophy, um, the dialectic between the one and the many, which one's more real, the multiplicity or the 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 unifying categories themselves, the essence of these things. And Christianity is the only one that makes a claim that the Godhead is both one and many. It's it's one essence and three persons. And this yeah, is the, the, the three aren't like a lower ontological category because you have like in, in 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 the in Vedantism, you have this idea that there's three hypotheses or whatever you could use of God, but they're always lower. Right? Yeah. it's always like a lower thing where it's like, no, no, it's not lower. And it, it breaks your mind and it breaks your thinking. But, you know, it's like, yeah. Right. And it's that personhood theology, because in in uh, Vedanta theology, the avatars are are dissensions yeah. of this Brahmanic force. So it's always like you're saying a lesser, a lesser, a lesser. And we can see this um, in the Western context and something probably similar to like Neoplatonism, where the logos is the first demiurge, the first creation, the first lesser form. But in orthodoxy, we're saying, no, that's not the case. Um, God proceeded from himself. And by definition, if the essence of God proceeds from himself, it's still God. And if God begets himself by definition, it's still God. Mm. And so that's what the logos is. And this collapsing of these dialectics and seeing that Christianity is the only one that maintains both one and the many and saying it's both. And that's yeah. the beauty of orthodoxy that, you know, the debates within the Western mind is always like one or the other and Orthodox say, no, it's, it's both. And, and, yeah, and that's so true about Orthodoxy in general. It's like, it's always yes. And, you know, you get into, com you get into co conversation with people. And it's like, it's the Bible. It's the Bible. And it's like, yeah, you're right. But not, not the Bible uh, and not that it's like the Bible and the Bible and the liturgy, the Bible and all it's like, it, it's a, right. it's a, it's a more, uh, yeah. It's a, like this, it's a different way of thinking. It is. It is. It's a different way of thinking. And it's that Eastern, you know, in the West, especially you can look at the 60s counterculture, this uh, fascination with Eastern mysticism, be it in the context of Zen Buddhism or Hinduism or Taoism. But orthodoxy, again, it's that royal path that's right in the middle, both geographically, but also literally that it's it's not this the Western, uh, you know, rational, propositional focus. But it's also not uh, totally mystical where it's devoid of personhood, which is what we're getting because personhood, again, tied to this Logos theology, one of the most important things is our ordo theologia is orthodox is beginning with being made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. There's three persons in one essence and being having personhood and being able to participate in these uncreated energies of God. This is what distinguishes us from the animals. But this also is a way in which distinguishes us from all the other religions, you know, Bishop Maximus and I know your friend John Verveke have been talking about Neoplatonism and orthodoxy and Bishop Maximus has been trying to hit uh, through through the three or four conversations is that orthodoxy is a participatory theology. This is yeah. very different than a propositionally based theology. It's not in the head. Yeah. It's in your heart. It's something that you actually live.
Yeah, I mean, we we have that that quote from from Evagrios in the it's in the Philokalia, I think, that says, you know, the 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 true theologian is he who prays. That's what theology is, right? It's right. talking to God. It's not so much talking about God. It's a it's, so it's definitely a it, yeah. It is. I think that it takes a long time for people to get that, even in the Orthodox Church, even in even like a lot of the catechumen, like they come in and I get it right there. Just like, what's the categories? How do we, you know, what's the, what, what are the definitions? I want to get it right. And, and you're right that it's part of it, but most of it is all right. Like, why don't you come to church and light a candle? Like come to church, light a <laughs> candle, kiss the icon. You know, it's like smell the incense, get, get you have to kind of enter into it. Exactly. Um, so I was wondering if maybe we can get into these logi. Um, again, like you talked about, the first video I saw of yours uh, was really profound. And you're talking about it was basically uh, I think the title was Santa Claus is real. And I was like, what is he talking about? So I clicked on it and you're talking about the the reality in which we move through the symbolic world. Again, the, the whole basis for uh, what you're doing over uh, on your channel and with your work. Um, what what did you mean for those who hadn't seen that video? That's one of your earlier videos. What yeah. what do you mean Santa Claus is real? That, yeah. I, I thought it well, was this conception. I thought it was a Coca Cola product. Yeah, and all. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think it's really it was really just to help people break through their materialist way of thinking. You know, people think that things that exist are only exist like in something that can be contained and perceived and held in the hand, which right. is which is which is ridiculous. But it's a it's a habit that we have. Uh, and we we enter into it. And especially when people, you know, the debunkers and these types of people that try to mock uh, religious phenomena, they, they tend to, to fall back on this very, very uh, annoying kind of uh, reductionism and materialism. But the truth is, that's not how it works, you know. And so in the video, when people I was mostly trying to say that Santa Claus, obviously Santa Claus exists, like he just go to the mall at Christmas. There he is. And he said, well, that's not Santa Claus. Well, it's a, it's, let's say it's the body of Santa Claus because you recognize it. Right. And you know what he looks like, you know how he acts. And if Santa Claus at the mall starts acting like a drunk guy, then you're going to be very disturbed by that and bothered. And so it's just to help people understand that beings don't, the idea that beings are just these limited things that you can hold in your hand is, is ridiculous. And that right. there are all types of levels of agency and all types of levels of being that you can experience. Uh, and you and, and the, the Santa Claus one was mostly as a, as a kind of humorous way to help you understand, for example, how you can exist in a city and how when you encounter a judge in a city, you know, that judge is not just Joe the judge. He is and he is a he participates in the body of an agency that acts on you, that can put you in jail, that can tax you, that can do all these things. And so you could say something like a city doesn't exist because I can't hold it. I can't do it. But, you know, when the cop puts the, the, the handcuffs on you and puts you in jail, you have to realize that there are levels of agency that are beyond the individual and just have to accept that. And, it, right. and, and thinking that way is now helping a lot of secular people, like, like you mentioned, John Braveke and other secular types, understand what angels are. And understand what demons are because they think that angels are just invisible people with wings. And it's like, yeah, we represent them that way. But the, the, the vast, you know, agencies and intelligences that have that have principality over large swaths of human existence, you know, it's more than just a bunch of invisible people with angels. It has more to do with understanding transpersonal agency and how it how it affects us and how we participate in these subtle bodies that that these beings have. Right. And your expl your explanation of the Santa Claus, again, gets back at what we just highlighted with the one in the mini and that you're highlighting that it has to be real because the category itself, the universal category of Santa Claus is this being then it's being substantiated by every mall Santa Claus that you see. It's the one in the mini coming. It's both and. Yeah. You see, it's an orthodox way to approach these things that is just so foreign to the Western mind because they're, they they presuppose the universal. But yet at the same time, they don't rationally uh, understand how that is the case. And they just perceive the the imminent, the, yeah. the, the multiplicity. And it's really important for people, especially now, to understand that because, uh, you know, a, a good a, if you don't believe in these these transpersonal agencies, then you always have to you have to always have to rely on massive uh, conspiracies like there's no other way. Right. right. Because. 
if Santa Claus doesn't exist, doesn't have some form of existence and agency over you, that means that there's this massive conspiracy of parents all over the world that all collude together to lie to their children about <laughs> this guy that comes in their house at midnight. And he's like, can you imagine a crazy conspiracy like that? Like the entire world governments are involved and like every single, in, the, in the, all of the West, you have this secret society of people who teach their children about Santa Claus. It's crazy. But if, right. so you don't need that. You just need to understand spiritual agency to realize that in order, when you notice patterns and behaviors in the world that actually coalesce you don't necessarily always need a human chain of causality for it to happen you just need to understand how transpersonal agency works and it actually it can help us to not go into crazy paranoid uh, fantasies when we notice patterns because then right. we start to imagine all these like weird secret uh, uh conspiracies <laughs> like you actually don't need them for it to be right. real you wait it's worse because sometimes it's just demons because so it's right. worse because it's like, but it's 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 less. It'll maybe it'll make make you less paranoid to say, you know, it's just a demon that's that's manifesting itself in the world. You don't need all human agents all across for it to be real, right? And it ties back to then how archetypes work, and that's where I want to move next is the archetypes and these logi and how that relates back to this larger concept of logos, which is who Jesus Christ is. For those who are new or haven't caught on. The Logos is Jesus Christ. The Logos is what incarnated into space and time. Um, and so you're talking about Santa Claus and these archetypes and the reality of the archetypal uh, realm, if you will. And, and for so many of the Western mind, they hear archetypes, they think of Jung, and then they think of the, the, you know, the, the unconscious. Um, well, within their own Darwinian framework, the the world itself is constantly changing and the unconscious is formed by our own personal experience with the world. Therefore, the unconscious and these archetypes of the father and the mother and the hero, they should also then be changing because by definition, it's all based on a sort of a fluid framework because they don't have a metaphysical point to root it in, which is what Logos theology is doing. It's saying, no, no, guys, you can have your archetypes. Plato was talking about this well before Christianity, but you have to have a metaphysic in which these concepts and these ideas are rooted in so they are unchanging through space and time. Because yes, Heraclitus is right. You don't step into the same river twice, but that doesn't mean that everything is fluid and unchanging. I mean, I agree that I usually even don't even use the word archetype in, in my videos because of the Jungian problem where people tend to understand our, it's a perfectly legitimate word by the way St. Gregory right. Nista uses it uh you know in his in his writings and so it's just that people tend to associate it with this idea that it's somehow psychic structures right whether these archetypes are psychic structures but that's not what we're proposing we're proposing that they are universal structures and that reality actually unfolds based on these on these structures and it's not a it's not like it doesn't you don't have to understand it as like a magical <laughs> a kind of magical thing uh but the world has to be patterned and it's not just a psychic thing in order for anything to exist in the world there has to be order in the in the particularities and right. that's it that's all it is it's just that the order of that that binds particularity to one that's an archetype and so you can understand it very low in terms of you know how molecules bound together to form higher form uh higher forms of of uh, right. qualities but then you can also do it from a human perspective that is for me to be able to recognize certain certain categories uh across space and time they have to be bound by a pattern and like let's say the pattern of fatherhood right. it's just a real pattern it doesn't mean that it's an in, in its instantiation, there can be variability and there can be variability across it. But ultimately, it leads to one, especially as you get higher and higher and you move towards the divine logos himself. And so in some ways, you could say that all the logi and all the patterns, they are not absolute. They're not infinite. They are limited and they are, you know, they have a they have a kind of a relativity to them. But that relativity is always pointing up and up and up and up and as you follow that line then you reach you reach the the you reach the divine logos i mean not not with your thinking but even in experience you start to see through the glimmers of these patterns that there's something holding them together you know at the summit of it can you uh, explain for people then what we're calling archetypes how in an orthodox worldview they are called the logi as saint maximus talks about the divine principles of creation 
And like you're saying, this, these are the divine principles that sets the pattern for reality. Um, can you explain a little bit about what these low gi are and how they relate to that? I mean, I, that's a way, the way that I see them is that they're the reason, like they're right. the reason why you perceive something in the first place. Like they're the reason why multiplicity is binding into one. Why is it that when I look at the world around me or experience the world around me, I don't just experience in infinite, infinite chaos and infinite multiplicity. It's like, no, I experience different levels and there, there, there's a lot of patterns, like there's a lot of levels and, and there's almost indefinite levels and, and play of patterns. But I always am able to see the one through the, through the many. And that line, yes. right, that line is that line that kind of drives you up towards, uh, towards the divine logos. Uh, and right. it's not, um, right, it's not, a, it's not a rational, it's not an exercise in thought. It's an exercise in experience. And that's why we yes. tend to say that, oh, you know, we it. talk about the noose as this capacity to kind of grasp things, right? right? To grasp their unity without the dialectic, without the thought process. Uh, and so in some ways, um, perceiving the divine logos is closer to almost physical experience in the sense that it's a, it's like a, it's, it's just intuitive. It's like this intuitive grasping of the one. And right. most people aren't even aware of it. They don't, they're not conscious of it. You know, we experience the noose all the time. The noose is actually what drives the way that you function in, in reality. But because we're so clouded by our passions and our thought that we, we don't tend to, to see it. But we do have that capacity to just grasp the one. That's right. that's what would that's what leads you into into the logi. And that noose is such a fundamental anthropological point because it's we're not just mind, body, soul. Yes, if somebody saw noose and translated, they'd say, Oh, well, that's just the Greek word for mind. Yes, but orthodoxy, as we've done with everything, resanctifies whatever we're talking about. And so the noose is the eye of the heart, it's the eye of the soul that the way that you're participating with these patterns, which is going to be tied to morality, which is going to be tied to speaking truthful things, which is going to be tied with how you treat people. This is essential for how you're going to see that line through the Logi, through these archetypal patterns of reality back to the Logos, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity. And so therefore, we, I've always talked about the archetype, if you will, of the evil genius is somebody who is the noose is totally darkened. So yeah, they're, they may have a high IQ. They may have the highest IQ, mm. but at the same time, they're totally irrational despite they're using reason instrumentally for whatever ends that they have to conquer the world or to, to yeah. have power over people. But it's still irrational. It's self-defeating because the ways in which they live their life, they have darkened the noetic faculty of themselves that they really can't see God and they really can't see them these these instrumental patterns in creation. Yeah, and I think that, that, that the word instrumental is the right word to, for people to understand sin or to understand the fall and the, the say how the Logi get darkened. And the way the Logi get darkened is through this kind of instrumental thing. It's, it's, a, funny, it's a funny situation, but the idea is that in some ways, if you grasp something for what it is only, it immediately becomes perverted, right? It's so... And rather the the if you if you see through it, like there's a sense in which there's a line that follows through it into something higher that beyond it, that's when you kind of follow this line of Logi. So it's not it, it like I said, I want to be careful not to sound like I'm saying arbitrary things, but if you if you I love to use sports analogies because they're so easy to understand. So if you if you play basketball. And there are certain things that you're doing in basketball, right? You're dribbling, you're passing, you're, you're throwing the ball, you're doing all these things. Like all these things that you're doing, you never want to grasp them for themselves, right? So if you grasp dribbling and you're like, man, I'm going to dribble and I'm just going to dribble for dribbling. And so you're <laughs> going to lose the game, right? Because that's a ridiculous right. thing to do. You have to see through the dribbling towards the purpose of mm. what it is, right? I'm dribbling so that I can score points so that I can win the game. And then, but then that goes up. Obviously it doesn't stop at sports. Like the idea is like, if things are lined up towards their higher purposes, then that's when you, that's when you participate the, in them in the proper way. But when you try to grasp them for themselves, then you're done. Like then, then that's what that in some ways, that's what sin is. So in our lives, it's usually happens in terms of thoughts and in terms of de of desires, right? It's like right. eating is great. Eating is a beautiful, wonderful thing. But if I try to grasp it for itself, 
then I'm disordered. Then I'm then I'm obsessed by food. You know, I get fat. Right. I, I I all these things happen to me that are that are because I'm not I'm not going to the logos and moving up towards a it's higher the destruction of the patterns. The gluttony literally begins to kill you, which is yeah. the nature of sin, right? Sin yeah, that's is right. It's the nature of sin. It's, it's a nature of pride. Power. It's like when you think that you've got it. It's like as soon as you think that you've got it and you're God and you're at the summit, then then you've cut yourself off from higher participation. And it's a right. deep irony because in, in, in orthodoxy, we do believe in theosis. Like we right. literally believe you could become God and not just you, but all of creation is right. called to be deified. Right. And the only way for it to, to, for it to, to happen is to die to oneself. Right. It's the opposite of what we think. It's like if you actually let go of your pride and you let go of your grasping at the different levels, then all of this is going to participate in God. It's actually... I mean, it's wild, but it makes sense once you start right. to see it in that way. It, it does. And, you know, one of the conversations I saw you had with uh, with Jordan Peterson after, um, you know, some of the experiences he had um, uh, medical problems that you had a conversation with him and it, he came to tears thinking about, again, this participatory and that this logo stuff, which it seems like he has his finger on most of it. But when it comes to it literally incarnating that mm -hmm. it was an actual historical person, that God became a man. And it's not some pragmatic truth we live by, but it's a reality. It, I, I remember you telling him that, and it brought him to tears because it's the only thing that makes all of what he's talking about come back together because that's what the incarnation is. It's the recapitulation of everything back into the participation of God. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's the hardest thing. It's like, it's the hardest sell for, for secular people because people are so ruined, like we're so ruined, you know, and, and there's a way, like the way that I tend to try to do that is I tend to go slowly and try to point, show people the story of Jesus, because it's, you know, we can say that, like Jesus, the incarnation is the, is the summit of the world, right? It's the place where heaven and earth meet. It's the place where the divine logos, uh, you know, empties himself into, and all these terms, they sound so weird, but it's, it's really there in the story, right? Jesus's story is a crazy story where everything collapses and everything is united and everything is, right. you know, and it, and it's a, uh, it's an amazing thing. It, it just, you just kind of, especially for secular people, you just kind of have to bring them in slowly because the story of the crucifixion will just shatter you. Once you start to see it, like for what's actually going right. on in that story, it's just, it's a crushing story. Every It's like everything is there. Like the whole cosmos is in that story. <laughs> right. No, I couldn't agree more. Um, can we speak a little bit more than about um, the incarnation um, and why this is so essential for this logos theology and for what we were talking about theosis, because we're called to participate in God and by the grace of God in the engagement with his uncreated energies. If we as created entities, which are limited, can engage with these uncreated energies of logic and reason and love and mercy and compassion and truth and beauty and honor and glory, we can become more and more like God. This is the gift of God's incarnation. This is the opportunity that we're all called to, um, you know, and then the cross, again, we could get into the semiotics of it being this point in which this, all this stuff fully comes back together. Uh, could you speak a little bit to the importance of the incarnation in regards to all this logos theology? I mean, the incarnation is the key, and it's a key. It really is a key. It's a key in terms of story. It's a key in terms of understanding. Because one of the things, for example, like even if you take Jungian, Jungian, Jungian ideas, right, there's a sense in which we have this problem, which is that, you know, intelligence seems to be the, seems to be the characteristic of humans. And so even in the old world, they would ask questions sometimes, like, are the gods, do they exist? Are there a, proje are there a projection of us? Like a projection of our own psychic, our, our psychic uh, uh, thoughts and our own structures of mind, you know, and so there's actually a legitimate concern about that, and a legitimate question, but that gets solved in the incarnation, because it's it's in some ways you could say, it's this is a crazy thing, but it's totally orthodox, by the way, is <laughs> to say that the man Jesus Christ created the world. Yes. And like St. Maximus says crazy things. He says, you know, when Christ was on the cross, he was creating the world. 
And so it's like, yeah, it's like that, that solves people don't realize just how many problems that solves, even in terms of metaphysics and in terms of understanding, you know, the nature of the world and how we don't have to deny the fact that intelligent categories uh, mirror through the the human mind. It's actually not a problem. It's actually our role. It's actually what we're there for. That's why God created us is to be that intermediary that inter- intermediary space between the invisible principles and the, the the indefinite aspect of of the world, and so, but that culminates, right? So it's like the whole structure is like this structure that points and points and points, and so just like in you, let's say there's an there's that noetic aspect, you know, where it all comes together, and you have that space, the eye of the heart, where you can encounter God. All the cosmos also has that same structure. It's like it points, it points, it points. Right. And then when when the figure of Jesus Christ appears, it's like that's it, that's the point. That's that point where it all comes together, and it's objectively it's objectively real in the story. You can see why it's real in the in the way that Jesus interacts with people, what he's doing, all the different prophecies that he's kind of bringing together towards yep. the cross. Uh, but then it's the surprise, man, the surprise of the cross. Like what? Who could have expected that? Right. Like, who could? And then, but when it happens, and you realize that this is it. Like this is the only way that it can be real, and it's it has to do with what we talked about in terms of the logi. Mm-hmm. Like reality can only be fully real if it's constantly emptying itself. If it's constantly emptying emptying itself, both in some ways like towards God, but then also even higher identities always have to kind of empty themselves to give themselves to the lower participation. Right, because you know you can't have the pure cup. You only have a mitigated version of that. And right. so the cup gives itself, right? It kind of gives itself towards its participation with its particulars. Right. So you're like, oh, that's what it is. That's what yep. this whole sacrifice thing from the beginning has been. Like yep. the, these the, these people kind of trying to figure out, like, why do we, you know, we're sacrificing these animals. We're sacrificing people. Like, what are we doing? You know, what is this thing we're doing? And the cross just resolves it all. It's like, yeah, that's actually how the world works. Right. right the here. cross, the cross ends that that process in a sort of uh, profane way and brings it all back together in a single person, which recapitulates that as as you and uh, Jordan Peterson talked about the limit story. I mean, the the story of Christ, which isn't a story; it's a reality. But it's you couldn't write something that is more to the limit of, of categories that you can't, you just cannot. I, and I, like, I would dare anybody to do it. You could only maybe do it something similar in the wake of the story of Jesus, but right. think about you Think just about what's going on. Like, just think about the cross. Like think about here's Jesus innocent crucified as a criminal on the cross with a sign above his head that says he's the King <laughs> that, which is I- ironic but it's not ironic. Ultimately, it's like this weird thing where it's like it's irony and it's a double irony and a like a triple irony. It's as if yes. the whole world is being it's like turned in this tumbler where you know you, it all just collapses. Right, uh, King of the Jews, but the Jews then are killing him for claiming that he's the, or, or fulfilling the prophecies yeah. of the Old Testament. And so this whole thing, and then being humiliated, he's God incarnate, but then he's naked in front of his mother. I mean, the whole thing is you 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 literally could not write yeah. something. That was more limit in every dimension. And I love what you're talking about, the sort of um, dissension on high to the lowly places. And that's what the Logi is doing. And that's why Christ was concerned with the prostitutes, with the poor, with the sick, yeah. with with the people, the lowest people of society, because and that's why the, the last will be first. Um, you know, the lowly will be elevated. This is the reality of God. This is, you know, I had Father Turbo on and he was talking about we did a whole stream on the theology of humility. And one of the biggest takeaways I had on that, he says, he said, why, why is the ocean the most powerful body of water? It's because it's the lowest body of water. Yeah. All other bodies of water flow back into the ocean. That's what God is. God had to humble himself as the lowest so that everything can return back to him. And it's like, wow, that makes so much sense. Yeah, it's it's a no, it's a yeah, the story of, the, of Jesus just it's just crazy. It's a crazy story. I, you know, you can never get to the end of it. Every time I, I go back every Pascha, I just, especially during this, uh, some of the services, like especially the services of lamentation, uh-huh. those services, they did just crush you. you know, right. there, there, there's some like, there's some, what is it? That sentence it says, 
talks about Jonah, kind of Jonah, but referring to Christ. It says Jonah, Jonah came out of the fish as if from the bridal chamber. And it's like, came out of the monster as it came out of the monster as if from a bridal chamber. So can you have images like that anywhere else? Like this crazy contraction of like, of, of, of yeah, anyways. And yeah. it's weird because then you see in scripture, right? It talks about the idea that, you know, the lamb that was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. And so right. the cross is actually revealing something like it's not just an answer to sin. It's revealing a very deep mystery, which is actually the very origin of of creation itself. Right. Um, Timothy right. Petitza has a wonderful image in his book, the the uh, the ethics of beauty, where he kind of he you know he's kind of he's speculating obviously, but his speculation is quite powerful. He says one of the things he has this image where when Adam took the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and he and he was able to see the tree of life. Right. So it's like. It worked, right? It's like if you take the not the, the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then then you have access to the tree of life. Then when he came to the tree of life, he saw the cross and he saw Christ on the cross, right. and he couldn't handle it, right. right? It was it was way too much. It's like that's not what he thought he would see there, <laughs> you know. And that's one of the reasons why he freaked out and covered himself and ran away basically because it was right. just too much. To, right. to deal with. And as St. Maximus said, uh, again, what you highlight is really this big distinction between East and West Christianity that, you know, St. Maximus talked about whether we fell or not, Christ was going to incarnate because theosis is the central crux of Orthodox theology. Theosis is the point. Uh, of course, unfortunately, most of Western Christianity doesn't have a, yeah. a, a theotic journey in their relationship. It's more of a submission or, or an atonement for one's guilty sins. It's not this continual participation, which then revivifies why I want to repent. Yeah. I want to repent because I want to continue to participate in this life-giving reality. And it only, it's the only, theosis is the, to me, at least, is the only thing that makes sense of creation. Right. It's just the only thing that makes sense of creation. Because I remember when I was younger, I'd ask people, like, why did God create the world? And the answer was something like, God created the world so we could worship him. And I was kind of like, that's kind of weird. I mean, it, it seems at least lacking. Like, it, it seems like it's not enough. Right. So God created us so to worship him, to worship him. And now we're all going to, like, suffer. And, like, all these people are, like, going into the fire. And what the hell? Like, what a weird way of understanding. And so, of <laughs> course, God did create us to worship us. But... This idea, rather, that out of love, out of overflowing love, right, God created something which he then can see and can love and that can be brought back into himself, you know, without destroying it. It's like that's a way more, more beautiful image of what creation is for. And that's the that's theosis, right? It's right. this idea yep. that, that, that God is so much love that he kind of he overflows into all this multiplicity. And then then that multiplicity can look back and be united in a kind of ecstasy to back into God without, like, like I said, but also without destroying it itself. It's like, right. I you know, know what, what, we were beautiful thing, vision what my, brought me my, into the Orthodox faith. I was in my first year of my PhD program. I was doing research on this book, the psychedelic gospels, which is highlighting all these psychedelic frescoes um, in, in Western Christianity, mostly Southern France, Southern Germany, Northern Italy, uh, Turkey, and at the time, I had a very successful YouTube channel that promoted psychedelics. Um, I've no, I haven't posted in it in like three years. It still has like seventy some thousand subs. But um, I was, I was doing this research, and I said, you know what? I bet all those icons in the Eastern Orthodox Church, I bet they'll also have indications of this idea that the mushroom, the psychedelic mushroom, was the Eucharistic reality. And again, as many of these uh, scholars would argue, it's been a sanitized version, right? It's been they, 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 they made sober this inebriating mysticism. Well, I took a whole class on the theology and history of the Orthodox Church as a non-believer. And that's how I got introduced to Logos theology. Mm -hmm. and, and again, all the intricacies of it, still a non-believer. But by the end of that, when I entered back into uh, the, the summer began to, to start, I was like, man, if I was to be religious, because I was spiritual, but not religious, thought I was you know, perennial, thought I was really advanced. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that Logos theology is really interesting. Fast forward a few months, I did a high dose LSD trip and all the things that I thought I believed uh, were all one. Well, Christianity says, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, I was obsessed with like sacred geometry, fractal mathematics, you know, pi, phi, Fibonacci, sacred space, mm -hmm. um, 
the idea of deification. All these things then are again re-sanctified in an orthodox worldview. And it was the point in which I turned back on you know all that stuff and became Christian at least. It was uh, it said, you know what, Christianity has to be the way. I was kind of like orthodox but Protestant, so I loved mm -hmm. orthodox theology, but I, did, I wasn't ready to submit to the church yet. So it was like Protestant, okay, it's more of like an intellectual thing, but that journey eventually brought it full force where it can't just be ideas. It has to be, again, a lived reality. And, and for me, seeing how orthodoxy, whether it be transhumanism, the new age and psychedelic spirituality, the things that are most appealing to the Western mind are just subtle inversions of the reality of the Orthodox church. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I didn't know that you came from the psychedelics world. It's like, what a weird world. Like all these people, I, I'm not in that way. Like I've never taken psychedelics. So it's like, a, it's like a very strange thing to me. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mean, glory to God, if that, if that, if you glory were God. able to, to kind of out of that, that world to, to, to see through it. And you're not the first person that I met that also having taken psychedelics kind of had a had a experience that ultimately brought them to the church and so you know i caution people against that stuff for i do sure too. but it, but I, but it seems like i mean like i said god, god will use all kinds of things so happy that he used that to bring you into into the right into it, it, and it does i think it, it it's it's a it's a dissolving a boundaries process and so mm -hmm. the reason why people say oh we're all one is because phenomenologically what psychedelics are doing are, are dissolving these boundaries but what orthodoxy does is it allows the unification of all these categories, but it maintains the boundaries. Yeah, without and when we're looking at the inversion of this pattern filled reality. Maybe we can get into this. This is what Satanism is. Satanism is the dissolution of these distinctions of God's divine principles and blurring it all together, making it one thing. This is the, the false appeal of unity but it's a total inversion. And so we're seeing this with the, the dissolution and with transhumanism, the dissolution between man and machine. We're seeing with the transgender movement, the dissolution between male and female, yeah. uh, all these things that the dissolution of national boundaries is getting ready to, you know, really, we've already seen it, but it's, I'm sure it's going to continue to ramp up. This is the satanic inversion, which people think they're moving in, in a progressive or, or there's making real progress, but it's the dissolving of boundaries, which I would argue as an Orthodox Christian now, this is a satanic process. Yeah, it's the it's the confusion between between confusion and transcendence. You know, like people think that conf confusion, or like you said, the the dissolving of boundaries in manifestation, they think that that's equivalent to transcending those opposites or transcending that multiplicity, and and uh, and it's not the same at all, right? You know, the difference between the difference between a higher unity of something, like if you join things together and they participate in a higher unity, like if you take a bunch of food and you cook it together, you bring it together and you make, you know, chicken Parmesan. And so <laughs> then you have one thing, you have one experience, but then it's made up of all this beautiful multiplicity. That's the, that's different than, you know, like basically just making mud like just make it just right. putting stuff together dissolving the boundaries making a bunch of of like a, a mud that's not the same and the modern world tends to be moving towards a kind of mud but th that's the weird thing about it the kind of satanic inversion is that it's an extreme of both it's actually not just one way it goes both ways at the same time the way to understand it is that it dissolves here and it unifies uh totalizes here yeah so it tends to to dissolve the boundaries dissolve neighborhoods dissolve intermediary communities dissolve churches dissolve families like i said dissolve gender dissolve all these differences uh and then at the same time sets up crazy systems of control on top of that and so it's like it's actually i i would say it's like a deincarnation right it's like oh yes like, it's like order becomes more and more totalitarian and it then there's also at the same time this chaos happening at the bottom. It's the image the, the, in Revelation. It's the image of a whore riding a beast. That's the best right. way to understand it. It's like you have two licentiousness, chaos, mixture, you know, and 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 all that stuff on one side, and then really, really hard, like civilizational control on the other. Um, but then the thing is that ultimately, at least in Revelation, ultimately the beast kills the whore. Right. Yeah, all this mixture is going to lead toward, uh, you know, 
I mean, that's why a lot of people see that it's leading toward a kind of communism or something like that, or a kind of authoritarian communism, uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't end with everybody just, it doesn't end with everybody just like drunk on their couch partying with no <laughs> distinction. No, it doesn't end like that. Like it ends with, it ends with the ax coming down and right. And, yeah. Right. They, you don't get away from the hierarchy. You either the hierarchy of the logos, which we're talking about, which is the hierarchy of the, the, the divine principles behind creation itself, or you get the hierarchy of Satan. You get it. Uh, yeah. You get an one, he, he has dominion over, over this, this realm. And, and so as we, he dissolves the boundaries, everybody is being subsumed back into his dominion more that, and more and more. Yeah. That's the best way to understand it. That's the best, the best way to understand it. And so, you know, when we say divide and conquer, it's not a it's not a ridiculous idea. It's like if I can dissolve, you see that actually. By the way, it's interesting. Like as you see it in um, in Exodus, you see an image of that where the Pharaoh is trying to reduce Israel to the feminine. He's actually trying to reduce their 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 existence only to potential that he can rule over, and that's some that's a good way to understand it. It's like. By by destroying families, by destroying churches, by destroying Boy Scouts and all these intermediary uh, institutions, we kind of become a bunch of individuals just on a map, like right. just a bunch of individuals that that don't trust each other. And the only thing then that's needed is is something to control it. Like you just need something above that we can all look towards to uh, that will give us uh, order. So yeah, and related to that individualism that's like the atomization of who we are as orthodox we're made in the image so your personality your personhood your your name these are important things these aren't something you know you're not just uh, an atomized concept you're not a cog that can just be filled in by another individual we have unique gifts and talents and relationships and this is because truth is a who not a what uh, something i say all the time on this channel truth is a who not a what and so um, the relativism that is emerging in the satanic reality, it, it forces that. Well, it's my truth. It's my truth. This is self-worship. This is the fall of Lucifer. This is the recapitulation of Luciferian fall into Satan. This yeah. is the angelic fall. This is me falling from the image of who God made me to be into, you know, what I argue is that what they're doing is they're destroying the image of God in themselves by the continual transgression of the boundaries of sin and good. And this is what I think we're seeing in the world itself is that people are literally destroying the image of God because they're destroying uh, the idea that there is objective truth and that truth then is tied to a person. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a trick. It's so, it's such a funny trick. Like it's a trick to, it's really the trick of the serpent, right? It's just the same trick that's there in the garden of Eden. It's like, you know, you, you know, you could be God if you just, if you just take it for yourself. That's the way it works. But then then the ridiculous, the, the the joke is that if you do that, you know, then you you cut yourself off from this higher participation that we're talking about. And then you become a slave. You become a slave of sin. You become a slave, uh, you know, ultimately of the evil one. That's what happens. It's a it's right. a it's hilarious. And we do it all the time that we're such idiots. Like we we nonetheless, we every time we we sin, we we fall, we give into that trap. Right. The the irony that is we do away with God and elevate ourselves, we actually become the slaves of sin, the That's slaves right. of the evil one. Whereas we submit to these principles, these patterns in creation, we then are actually elevated through the theotic process of theosis. Yeah, and that and that ultimately ends up being the that ends up being the image of Christ, right? That ends up being the ultimate Christ is the limit version of that story. Or we're in full submission to the Father, full capacity to kind of to give himself then he is raised up to the to the divine throne right um how again wrap, wrapping up our conversation i know you're a busy man you got things you got to do um how does iconography then one of the biggest uh you know uh, objections i have protestants that come on um and well not on the stream but at least in the live chat and their biggest thing with orthodox is oh you guys you, you guys worship graven images they don't understand what devotion is they don't understand um uh how iconography is utilized within our theology and of course then it's it's mary oh you guys worship mary no we don't they don't they don't understand that well you don't you ask your grandmother to pray for you well we do the same thing because the saints are living the saints are still alive yeah. we, we ask them to intercede for us how does 
iconography, and I know that you are an iconographer and you do a lot of work. How does that then bring together this whole reality that we've just been talking about, the incarnation, the logos, divine principles, um, symbols, archetypes, beauty, truth? It all comes together in the icon. Yeah. No, I, that's totally true. The best way to understand, the best simple way to understand iconography for people from a Protestant perspective is to think that all that is in the Old Testament is pointing to Christ, right? That That is the right. reason for the laws, the reason for the prescriptions, they're all ultimately pointing towards Christ. Uh, and even in the Ten Commandments, for example, we don't celebrate the Sabbath because, because Christ came and he and he changed that seventh day into the first day. He changed. He celebrated the perfect Sabbath, and now we celebrate the resurrection. Right. And so it's the same with images. It's like the reason for the second commandment is Christ. I don't know what to tell you. The reason that God says you can't worship images is because God is going to give us an image, right. and He did, and He gave <laughs> us an image in Christ. Oh, That's the that. reason for the second commandment. And and so Christ is the image of God. He is not only the image of God, but he's the restoration right. of the image that God put in man in Genesis 1. And right. so Christ resolves the problem, re you know, restores it all. And so unless you kind of understand why it is that there's a prescription against images and how it relates to Christ, then it's weird to object to iconography. We now, with, with icons, we celebrate that. We celebrate the fact that Christ has restored the image of man that the image is now li literally a mode of revelation of God. Like if before the name was a mode of revelation uh, and the presence was a mode of revelation, now the image is a mode of revelation of God. And so Christ has restored that. Right. Uh, and then what happens in the icon, which is astounding, is that you can have a kind of experience of of the Gospels and an experience of the, of the truth of Christ, which is the simultaneous... Can I say this? It's like it's almost like a map, like a map of reality that is simultaneous instead of in a story and in time. And so you can take things like in the crucifixion, you can take things, all these elements of the crucifixion, you can bring them together and you can have a, a, a an experience which is very close to <coughs> when we talk about this noetic grasping. It's like in one instant, you can kind of see it all coming together in an image and it just hits you. As right. as helping you understand how these these different elements come together into one, you can have a very very powerful insight when you look at icons. Right, <laughs> and the irony is the again we venerate icons. We don't worship a piece of wood. I'm well aware this is a piece of wood with paint on it, but it's been sanctified. It, it's a window into eternity, as we we typically say in orthodoxy, and that these are venerative windows. We venerate God through the icons. We don't worship a piece of wood. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Yet it's easy. Look, it's easy to understand this. It's it's it, even for Protestants, you know. I mean, you can disagree, but at least understand it. In the Old Testament, we we worship the holy name. We use worship. The word worship means venerate. Like we we raise up the name of God. We 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 lift it up. We we lower ourselves before the name of God, and that happens in the Psalms constantly. Now, if I ask you, is the name of God God Himself? And you would, say, <laughs> right. of course not. Of course, the name of God is in God Himself. Right. Then why are you lifting it up? Why are you why are you lowering yourself before the name of God? And the answer is because it is that by which God has revealed himself to us. Right. And so in the Old Testament, people constantly lower themselves, celebrate, venerate the means by which God reveals himself to them, whether it's the tabernacle, whether it's the altar, <coughs> whether it's the 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 uh, the the ark of the covenant. And now the truth is that God has revealed himself in image to us. Right. And so there's absolutely no problem, just like there's no problem in lifting up the name of God. We lift up the image of God as well because Christ is the image of God. Right, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> One of the things before we get off, I wanted I, I wouldn't forgive myself if I didn't bring it up since I have you here. As you recently posted a clip on the genie's lamp in relationship to again I, I did a whole stream with father turbo on these black mirrors yeah and how this relates to to uh you know conjuration magic all this different stuff but transhumanism obviously is something that i, I spent a lot of time researching on and writing about and 
the advanced artificial intelligence, the uh, cryogenic freezing, the all these things that they the the the, the cyborg being able to you know put in prosthetic limbs and, and connect it straight into your spinal cord. The video that you posted about the genie's lamp, I thought was so good. And something I've talked about with multiple preset have come on here is um, speculation. It is speculation, but we'll, we'll put it out there for what it's worth is the Antichrist and how I believe what we're doing with these advanced artificial intelligence is, is a, an inverse incarnation. Satan can't be everywhere at once. He isn't omniscient. He doesn't have uh, you know, infinite power, but through the technologies which we're creating, through our creativity being made in the image, which he cannot participate in because that's an uncreated <clears throat> energy of God, in a way we're creating what I call the cybernetic skeleton of Satan. Yeah. And we're going to allow him to have attributes that are only related to God and that this antichrist figure that's eventually going to emerge, I believe he's going to be hooked up to that system and that's where he's going to be an agent for the evil one is that he will be fully hooked up to the 5g satellites the artificial intelligence you'll be looking at a man and he can open your garage door because it's all online it's yeah. all connected to the system and i was kind of wanted your reflection on that concept but that kind of where you see all this technology going and how it relates to what <laughs> we've been speaking about yeah i, I mean I, there's a how can i say this it's like there's a very robust tradition, you know, that there's a relationship between technology and magic. And, and also there's a relationship between technology and, you know, the sons of God in terms of the Enochian tradition, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I think that these things are important to understand today, to understand how the why tech, technification is part of the lineage of Cain. And why in the in the extra biblical tradition, there's this sense in which there's a relationship between technification, between uh, necromancy, uh, magic, and 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 yeah, and so and these 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 encounters with agencies that are beyond human agency, fallen agencies. Uh, so I think all these things are important to understand. Now it's also important to be careful not to be excessive because the image of the heavenly Jerusalem is a technical image it is an image of a city right and so it is not so there is it's not as if technification and technic yeah because evil has to, to have a will that's something i point out that even the mushroom itself that has psilocybin it can't be evil because evil from an orthodox it has to have a will yeah that's so why only angels and us can can participate if you will or reject god we have to willfully reject god and so a good way a good way to see it is that in in revelation there are two images of technology one is the heavenly jerusalem in which all glory is brought, like the glory of the nations is brought into the city mm -hmm. that is offered up to the Lamb and to the, the Son of Man. And so you can see that that line, right? That line of the Logi kind of moving up, giving itself up towards the highest. And then you have an image of the the, the beast, which makes, right? There's, there's three beasts. It's complicated, right? It's like the, the second beast, uh, which makes an image of the first. And then that image speaks, and then people worship the image of the beast. Mm -hmm. So now it's an idol, right? It's the image of the the, the image of Nebuchadnezzar in the book mm -hmm. of Daniel. It's, it's mm -hmm. this image of an idol, a technical image of man, which has intelligence and mesmerizes people by its intelligence. And so that's really, in some ways, for us, a time to pay attention because when we, we talk about artificial intelligence, and we have this idea that we're going to bring the technical into the world of intelligence. That is where we're creating a very dangerous situation. So right. you have to watch. There's a discussion. John Verveke put out a video just last week on AI, and it's wild. Like it's wild because obviously I don't agree with all his conclusions, but 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 he's talking about embodiment and he's talking about biological embodiment of AI, biological. Mm -hmm. A, a biologic, an artificial biological being that is that is an AI being, right. and that this would actually be the ultimate way to to like get to the the let's say to the highest point of AI would be to embody it because then it would experience desire and experience limits and experience uh, let's say reasons for acting. It's like, dude, that's crazy. Like we're in crazy territory, folks. Like if you, if you, you know, it's like, we're going to see things that you have never thought, like you, you would never thought that you would see monsters in the street. Like you never thought that you would see dragons. You never thought that you would see 
you know, the things that are only described in ancient myth and in, you know, and in, uh, in the legends. And it's like, right. it's going to be, it's happening fast. Right. Like we're going to see things that, 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 yeah, you're going to see things that your ancestors could only imagine. And so, and so it's, it's a crazy time and understanding that this, this, this danger of wanting to embody agency in artificial beings. I mean, that's what the genie of the lamp is, right? That's exactly, exactly what it is. And that's ultimately, I think what at least the image of the beast is. Which is filled with jinn, which are demons. Uh, that's right, which are which are, <laughs> which are transpersonal agencies, and so so I think that that if you want to understand, at least in the book of Revelation, this image of the beast and the image of the beast, it's like we're definitely moving in that direction. It's a scary, it's definitely a scary time for, in that in that sense. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more, and uh, the. The, you know, technology does so many beautiful things like we're able to have this conversation right now. So God can use all negatives. And that's why, uh, you know, I'm a big harper on no despair. Like it, we may talk about morbid or or, uh, you know, uh, not so bright topics. But as Christians, that's why, again, that's why the reality of Christ's incarnation is is salvation. You have to cling to that because as you experience that reality more and more. There's no reason to despair about any of this stuff. It's already been defeated. Yeah. The the battle now is whether we choose to capitulate to it or not. Yeah, and it's not, and it's there in the Bible, by the way. It's really not, it's not like we're just trying to to, to relativize, not to freak people out. You know, if you look at the, the lineage of Cain in scripture that develops all civilization, all technology, then the world ends, and the way out of it is also a technical thing. Right. But Noah's Ark is a technical object. It's a it's a it's a fabrication of man, which is this, like point. shell in mm -hmm. which Noah and his family uh, cross the flood. So even in the biblical story, it's not as if it's only one thing. It's not as if technology is only bad and certainly not only good. It's, it tends more <laughs> towards the bad. But there's a way in which at the end something happens where God transforms the evil into good and is able to make it participate. And that's the same, I, I think, with the heavenly Jerusalem, which is ultimately a saving of Cain's lineage it's ultimately saying you know this city that started with the killing of a brother that started with you know the the, the you know the tech the metallurgy and increase in desire and destruction is now glorious and radiant and full of god's presence so so god saves things you know that's what right. he does he saves everything yeah uh thank you again so much we have some questions if uh we just have a few more minutes we could could answer some of those um, first one comes from our buddy Frankie D throws in 1999 and says, God bless you, Jonathan. My first ever exposure to any orthodoxy came from stumbling on your channel while following Peterson. I follow you on Patreon. I had a question I wanted to ask you, but forgot it. Well, God bless. All right. Well, thanks, Frankie. It's good to see you. <laughs> Uh, and he threw in another one from 499 and said, it was so cool to see how much deeper explanation of the Bible and topology framework. It was far more sophisticated than I could have ever imagined. And I, I think that's partly the mystery and the mystical reality of the Orthodox Church is, um, you know, you may be a Protestant, you may know scripture inside out, but you worship your own interpretation or you worship some other man's interpretation. You're, you're not housed within the mystical tradition of the church which is interpreting the the books that they put together to form the canon yeah and and once you can see it from an orthodox lens i think scripture just makes so much more sense and also understanding that scripture is not just something to to stand apart from and to interpret scripture is meant to be entered into and and kind of it's it's like a it's actually becomes like a pair of glasses that you look at the world Yes. And so that's one of the things that makes the liturgical so real is that <clears throat> when we the liturgical practice, like all most of all the liturgical services you go to, whether it's liturgy or a Vesper service or or matins, it's like 90 percent scripture. But it's not like me preaching or explaining. It's me entering into then singing this psalm and comparing it to this to this verse in the, uh, you know, to this aspect of the, of the old Testament and the new Testament. And then I can see this web appear and it's like, that's the typology you're, you're, you're noticing. You kind of live in it. Right. <clears throat> and, it, and it brings scripture to life. And that just like <laughs> your symbolic world is taking a biblical Orthodox perspective and showing how this reality is all about right now. 
It's yeah. happening right now. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, the world is made of the Bible. Like the world is made of the, the same thing they made the Bible up is that's what made, you know, God created all of this. The Bible <laughs> is just a really compressed version of creation. It's like right. God took all creation. It's like, okay, you're falling. You can't see it anymore. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to push this together, you know, make these real, th this text so that you can see that actually the grace of God and the presence of God is filling the whole world. And he does it through <laughs> us, right? So all the prophets of the Old Testament, it, it's through space and time, revealing himself, people participating in him, and that he, rev we, ha again, God needs us, or no, no, we need God, but but God uses us to re recapitulate creation itself. And so just like the scripture, like you said, it's a condensed version of creation. Well, Again, he didn't just, which he could have just, you know, created the Bible and set it down on a rock and we could have picked it up. It's through people. People have to choose God, participate in God, and then God can work through us. And that's still tr as true today as it was for Jeremiah or Isaiah or whoever it is. Yep. Next one comes from Mud, throws in $2. And I think this is when we we're talking about some of the gender dysphoria. That I'm offended. Uh, totally kidding. He he's a he's a member here on the on the channel. God bless you, Mud. Thank you so much, brother, for the two dollars super chat. And one of our Orthodox sisters, Tatiana, who husband just got brought into the church. She's been Orthodox, and she's been asking us to pray for her probably for like a year and a half. And he just this Pascha uh, Pascal um, season, he just got brought in. And so, glory to God. Tatiana says, "Christ is risen. Truly, He is risen." This has been wonderful for my heart and my mind this morning. Glory to God for all things. Well, God bless you, Tatiana, and your family. Wish you nothing but the best. Um, we had one come in over here on Rockfin. Um, Agent Oct says, Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. I can't believe I actually get to hear one of your shows live. He's, uh, he's from Europe. I am assuming this will be an excellent stream. Great guest, as always. Uh, well, thank you so much, Agent Oct. Um, also, uh, we had some come in from my uh, brother over in Kansas City. Uh, PBF Live throws in twenty dollars. Says amazing chat, DPH. Thank you, um, and uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Perhaps in, in Cyprian, uh, there was a gentleman I had on previously. Perhaps one day with Father Turbo, too close out of. Oh, he's asking maybe one day you, me, and Cyprian. Cyprian is a, a Vin Armani. He. Um, he, he uh yeah he, oh, he's know, another no, Orthodox know, content creator. yeah i had discussions i've had a discussion with him uh, oh you have yeah okay yeah he's a great guy i love uh i love cyprian yeah perhaps one day with father have you met father turbo i have it's so it's so annoying it's like it's it, father turbo is definitely one of those people that i would really just kind of have on the channel and talk to and then life goes on and then i just kind of forget to organize it and it just kind of it's like, yeah, I mean, it would be great if you want to organize a, a talk with Father Turbo and the three of us. Like, yeah, I would love it. that. Yeah, and oh I can put it on my channel if you want and to kind of give some some visibility to, to what you're doing. So, yeah, let's do it. I'll be happy to participate. I would love that. I absolutely would love that. I will. I'll reach out to Lisa and Father Turbo. And yeah, do it. That That's up. great. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That'd be great. Yeah, I love Father Turbo. And he's going to be uh, we've been doing uh, shout out to Father Deacon, Dr. Ananias. He was on last night. We we're talking about humanism. Um, Father Turbo is going to be at Montanica this year. And so we do uh, here in the U.S. We have a, a meetup. It's at this. We're going to have Bishop Maxim of the Serbian jurisdiction, Father Turbo, Serbian priest. We're going to have multiple Serbian nuns going to be there. Um, and so we're going to have a great time. Um, so maybe one year you can uh, join us over in Montana. Uh, it's a great meetup of all Orthodox believers. And it's a beautiful place. The June in Montana. Is yeah, I think I was invited, but, you know, like a month ago it's like that's way too late to invite me i've got i sadly my schedule is filled up yeah you know yeah. Way well maybe 2024 we'll, we'll try yeah, to maybe. i'll maybe. tell father deacon to try to to try to get, get me ca catch me early yeah i got it <laughs> yeah catch you early um pbf live also said um uh oh apologies for my bad typing on the last message if it wasn't clear i was typing with an injury no we got it pbf live thank you so much brother and yeah i'm really excited i'd love to do one with you and father turbo uh, Keenan throws in five dollars. Said, "I like to thank Jonathan for playing such a pivotal role in my conversion. Thank you very much." Well, thanks, Keenan. And yeah, Keenan quite a fit, quite a bit. He's great. Yeah, I love Keenan. Um, and then uh, Meta Ninjas, shout out to Meta Ninjas. Throws in twenty five dollars and says, "Thank you both." Random question: What's your favorite Orthodox book of all time? 
I guess outside of the Bible. <laughs> Does that include the church fathers or is that you mean yeah, like yeah, a whatever, yeah, whatever church book. father book? Yeah, what are I, your favorite I, everybody author? knows like my favorite books are because I because I'm constantly quoting them. So it, <laughs> for sure, the, the life of Moses by St. Gregor Nisa is like that's mm -hmm. definitely I love that book. You know, I, I reread it over and over. Uh, and then and then the hymns on paradise by St. Ephraim the Syrian. Yeah, I love that. I love the hymns on paradise by St. Ephraim. Uh, that little book that you showed, you know, the little cosmic, yeah, the cosmic uh, mystery, mystery, Jesus the Christ. little St. Vlad's uh, book on St. Maximus. That's a wonderful little book. It's so, because St. Maximus sometimes is hard to read. And St. Vlad's really did a great job at pulling in, you know, the more, you know, the, the aspects of St. Maximus that are more like kind of the lens through which we can look at the world and a, kind of a cosmic image. I, I love that book as well. So I would say those are, those are my favorite yeah, I would say for me, the most pivotal book in my conversion was on the cosmic mystery of Jesus Christ. I read this as, again, that that liminal phase between uh, being a non-believer, but having then learned all about mm -hmm. Logos theology and basically knew all of what orthodoxy believed, but okay, maybe I'm not a believer. And then I read this and um, it just hit me right in the heart. Again, learning about the Logi, the principles of creation, Christ, again, literally being a cosmic mystery, how this really... Uh, this was huge uh, for me. Also, I love this book right here, The Freedom of Morality, which was given to me or recommended by my spiritual father. The Freedom yeah. of Morality was a, a, another huge one. That's by uh, Yana Ross, Yana Ross yeah. uh, by St. Saint, Saint Vlad's Press. So I would say um, for me, my conversion on the cosmic mystery of Jesus Christ and then once being Orthodox, the Freedom of Morality was a was a one that I really, really love. As yeah. well as I always recommend this one to people. Who are getting into the church? Byzantine theology by John Meindorf. I would argue that you know, again, we don't like you're talking about. We don't have a sort of definitional, systematic description of what orthodoxy is, which kind of frustrates Western people. But I would argue this is one of the best overall encompasses of what orthodoxy believes and how it arose. Okay, so thank you so much, Meta Ninjas, for that. And then Finlay throws in five dollars. Says great stream. Well, thank you so much, Finlay. Uh, Pogor P Pogorchel uh, throws in three dollars and says, "Thank you, Jonathan, for making me take the church seriously. Being from Romania, the whole religion thing was for old ladies when I was younger. <laughs> Have you thought about making some wallpapers for phones to download from your website?" Oh yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it, it's it's a the whole the whole product thing is complicated. It's you know, so so people know that I I, I have made like T-shirts and prints and stuff, but I'm all, as an iconographer, I'm always kind of asking myself, what's the limit? Like, what is it that you can have in these popular products? Uh, and so I kind of make semi icons. You know, I use the tough saints. Like, I'll make a Saint George, Saint Michael that are like killing dragons. Like, okay, maybe those can be can be out there in the world, kind of you know, like on T-shirts and things that are it will that will get that'll be get less veneration i say there'll be more that'll be more banged up you know so i try to think about it and try to figure out like what how to do it and not put inscriptions so people don't confuse these prints for icons and stuff but the phone stuff like yeah it just it seems like that's one step too far for me but it, yeah. it's not it, it's not an objective um like i'm not laying down the line here I, I this is really just my own kind of trying to figure it out right well and again you're so darn busy it's like uh, you got to focus on what's most important. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that's not, that, that can you know, something important. be on the back burner yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then last super chat comes from the real Cooter Brown throws in $7 and 50 cents. This has been a fascinating conversation and I hope to see more between y'all in the future. God bless you both. Christ is risen. Truly. He is risen. Truly is risen. Yeah. And, thanks. And this is, that's this kind of great. Jonathan. Thank you so much again for coming on. Uh, this has been a, a great conversation. I knew it would be, uh, I'm, again, thank you for your work. Thanks for everything you're doing and promoting the Orthodox faith. And I hope we can do it in the future. I will absolutely be uh, reaching out to Lisa and hopefully fa and Father Turbo and trying to set something up maybe in a month or two. Yeah, that'd be great. I would love that. All right. Well, anyways, guys, as always, I will be back uh, Sunday with Baselit Analyzer doing a movie review of Indiana Jones Raiders and the Lost Ark. Um, so I will see you all Sunday evening at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
Uh, Jonathan, I have your, again, you're, you're uh, tagged here. So guys click his link. Uh, everybody's going to already know who you are though. If you, you know, go to his YouTube channel, subscribe, share. Is there anything you'd like to say to the people before hopping off? No, no, thanks. It's been fun. Really great conversation. All right. Well, thank you um, again, as always, everyone, I will see you Sunday until then. God bless.